Hello, hello, this Thursday, no Max Simpson available here, so I'm helping steer the ship along with the man himself, Discount Captain Jack Anderson, I believe, is the, uh, what you've been dubbed? Yeah, that's my, new, that's my full title. That's the full title, the full title, full title, of course, the man formerly known as Discount Jake, Jake Anderson, welcome into the PHNX Rising podcast, uh, we've got a lot to get through today. Of course, rising dropping points late at the death against Indy 11 yesterday. Looking ahead to a big matchup on Saturday away to El Paso Locomotive. And of course, we'll have a little look around the league as well. There's lots, lots to get through. Let's start by looking at last night. Jake, you gave your first thoughts on the on the podcast. Of course, we had you hop on in. Uh, that's where your brand new nickname, of course, originated. Chat to the chat for that one. But um just overall now, had a little bit more time to, to reflect, to think. How are we feeling? Uh, something that I wish I would have mentioned last night, and I'll, I'll mention it now, is is every time Phoenix has had one of these blowout 5 nothing 6-1, whatever it is, one of these blowout victories, the following game, now granted, it wasn't, it wasn't a, a poor performance for the entirety like we saw when they went over to Miami, but it wasn't a full performance at all. The first half was absolutely a waste as Juan even said last night. Um, but yeah, it's it's the missed opportunity. You could have been in third. Granted, the, the teams you would have been ahead do have the opportunity to jump you with the game in hand. But still, you would be putting pressure on them. You'd be giving yourself the best opportunity possible to host playoff matches, which with only four games left, I think that's the number one goal that this team should have. And it, it it's just disappointing in the way that it happened. And I guess the only silver lining is that it happened in a regular season and not a playoff game to where... I don't really know if – I mean, let's say that does happen in the playoffs. Now you're going to extra time. Manu is off the pitch. I mean, there, there are different there are different intricacies to to how that whole match played out. So there's pluses and minuses. I think overall it's going to be a disappointing performance. But I, as I asked one last night, I think it is an advantage of the fact that it was a midweek game. You don't have a whole week to think about it. you got to just move on and, and get ready for El Paso. Indeed, indeed. Of course, though, look, if we were to break down those things, that first 45 minutes, it was it was borderline unwatchable, wasn't it? I feel like I've had this conversation several times today, but it was just borderline unwatchable, wasn't it? No, like it, it was it just like you like you tweeted, uh, 45 minutes happened. That's uh, that was about it. I mean, it, the, the stats say there was like a combined five shots, but I, I don't I, nothing happened. There was nothing, nothing was being created. Um, and then one last thing I'll, I'll add about last night is, you know, I, I talk about Panos being on the field a lot, but it wasn't necessarily Panos being on the field and being the one to do the work, but it also allows Danny to play in a position that's more advantageous to him. And we saw what happens when he got out wide and he took defender on 1v1 and he assisted. It, 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 it Panos makes his teammates better because he can take up the spaces that he controls best because Danny had to play centrally a little more than he's used to and that he likes to anyway. I mean, he definitely has experience doing it. Um, but it's it's just it's the consequence that Panos has for having such a high work rate. You can't work the guy 90 plus minutes three times in eight days. It, come playoff time, you're only playing once a week. Guys will be playing up to 120 minutes potentially. So last night's over and then they just got to they got to move on because, you know, if you if you keep looking back at it, it's only going to continue to to get worse. You just got to go on and get the three points on Saturday. Indeed, indeed. I mean, you are you are right with Panos, right? There's there's a side to it. And you see this with a lot of good players, right? You can't give them too much time and space to to do what they're going to do. And Panos in particular is a guy who, if you give him too much time, too much space, he's going to punish you out there. And so, yeah, that's going to, to draw people away, especially when you've still got Manuel Arteaga out there. You've still got Danny Trejo out there. Other people who, again, I mean, in an ideal world, you're trying to mark them out of the game. When you then introduce a guy like Panos as well, you're really, really stretching yourself thin. But one other thing, of course, we picked up last night, was mentioned on the podcast last night, but Gabby Torres expected to be out for a, a decent chunk of the remaining season, probably. I mean, I think I said on the podcast last night, I'd be surprised to see him now before the end of the regular season. Um, and of course, then come playoff time, it's a bit of a mess at that stage, right? Because you don't really have the time to, to work a guy in, the time to to get things together, get him back up to full fitness, to allow him to find his groove again. 
How much of a loss do you think that one is, Jake? I, I mean, I think we saw how much of a loss it was last night. It, it, when Granted, it, it, we're talking about the playoffs compared to the regular season when you have a midweek game and you have to have rotation. Last night's a perfect game to where Gabby, who – you know, may or may not start when we when he when he comes back. But last night is a perfect example to where you have, you know, Ponis not starting and and he has to get the rest that he needs. And Gabby can be one of those playmakers. I mean, him and Eddie, you know, on the outsides can create and it would allow, you know, Danny to to maybe flourish a little bit more in the middle. But without him, you we saw you know Formello playing on the wing, and I know that was sub, um, but he doesn't necessarily play out there. Um, and we saw him come centrally, obviously, once once Ponos did come on. Um, but it is a big loss, right? Because Darnell is not – I mean, he's, he's able to play, but he's not 100%, 100%. And when he did pick up pick up the injury, he was probably playing some of the best football he's ever played for this club, arguably. So it, it just it's unfortunate, the timing of it all. Um, and obviously, coming down the home stretch here, you hope to have everybody healthy and everybody ready to go and playing at their best form. But – I mean, that's the game. I mean, guys get hurt, and uh, we'll, we'll see who can step up. Um, I've been hoping to see Quajo step up and be able to get back into that form we saw at the very beginning of the season, but it kind of just seems to not be in the cards for him. So I- I'm just wondering what we're going to see on on the wingbacks now for, for Phoenix Rising going forward. Yeah, that's – I mean, you, you mentioned Quajo there. Of course, he's a guy who we saw early in the season struggle with injury after that initial reasonable bit of form. Um, kind of worked his way back in. It's been on and off for him, and really he hasn't been able to get a consistent run in the team. Um, I mean, even when coming back from injury, we've seen him often just kind of sidelined, um, sometimes on the bench, sometimes missing out entirely, not getting a whole lot of minutes whatsoever. Um, it'll be it'll be interesting to see if he does play more of a role now, especially, again, in a position where you don't have Gabby Torres at your disposal. Um, Donald King coming back, of course, does change things up a little bit, but even then, over the next game or two, not sure how many minutes we'll see him get. Not sure quite what's going to go on in terms of how much you want to rely on him in the rotation. But look, I think we, we've spoken enough about the the football on the field from from the last game. And in an ideal world, I think we'd, we'd rather never speak about that game again um, because there's just not enough really to talk about, I think, on the field with how, how poor it was at times. But one thing that we should speak about, I think, I, I, I want to know what your take on this one is, Jake, but from, from my perspective at least and and what I was expect well, not necessarily what I was expecting or wasn't expecting given the way that the season has gone at times and given the way that we've seen the crowds um, at games this season. But I was disappointed, I think, is the easiest way to put it, with with the crowd that um, that we saw out there last night and at least the, the, the size of the crowd. The people who were there were quite energetic, quite loud. They were into it. But the, the size of the crowd, I don't know. To me, it felt much smaller than I was, you'd hope for at least really at this stage of the season. Yeah, I mean, it, the midweek games are always tough, right? It's hard to bring uh, the whole family out because, you know, kids got practice themselves during the game. They have homework. They have school the next day. I, I understand that. It was basically what I was expecting for a midweek. Um, but with Dollar Beer Night, maybe you can get some college kids to come out. Um, but, yeah, I, going forward with only, you know, the two home games left, I believe it is, that – and, you know, hopefully hopefully you can get a playoff game as well. I mean, I mean, why not make every home game for the rest of the season Dollar Beer Night? Why not – give college kids five dollar tickets i mean you're you'd be investing in the potential of uh, someone who wouldn't come out or maybe who hasn't come out that often the weather's starting to get nicer you can show them what it's like when the weather is nice give them a good time hopefully they have a good performance and maybe they'll want to come back again more next year i mean it would be a long-term play but the the, the atmosphere is always better when there's more butts in seats i mean that's that's goes goes without saying but yeah, it, the the team's better than it was in the middle of the season when they were losing to Vegas at home and and just they were abysmal at times to be honest. But they've they've really come full circle in terms of, I mean, this is the best they've been playing all year. Four out of six wins, six unbeaten, and you're in the middle of a, of a home playoff chase. So it it's a disappointing crowd, but for a Wednesday, I think it's exactly what we expect or should expect anyway at, at this point. But I mean, give, give people reasons to want to come back. I mean, that's the biggest thing, in my opinion. Uh, it, yeah. Yeah, you're not, you're not wrong, but I, I still just... 
there are whole elements to it where I kind of question, like from from the club's perspective right now, what are they doing to reach out to certain people who haven't been to games before? What are they doing to? I mean, just I, I I'm trying to grasp in some ways what this club is trying to to push itself forward as right now. Um, I mean, I, I gen- generally think the club probably would have, have gotten a, a better crowd. I think they, they did get better crowds on times than those midweek Wednesday games at Casino Arizona Field when they were dollar beer nights at least. Um, I, I mean, Jack makes one comment that they haven't seemed to market themselves into the necessary market. So many people um, they talk to still think they play in Tempe. Yeah, I mean, that's... Yeah, I echo that. A lot of people don't know that they play at 38th in Washington. No, no, right? And... It just feels as though this season has become, in some ways, a, a write-off of sorts on that front, at least, not on the field. On the field, you've got a very clear identity. On the field, you've got a very clear uh, progression and, and I think, a, a potential competitor this year. But off the field, I don't know. It just doesn't seem like it's quite quite mashing. Um, it's not quite working at the moment. We know that there is obviously concern um, from those in in leadership in the club at least about quite what they're doing you know when you're looking at some of the people that we have conversations with on match days of course there's concern right it's 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 not really something you can hide when you're looking around and see a stadium that's got a a lot of empty seats in a location that was had a lot of hope um Here's my question, and and we're not in their front office. We're not in their offices, right? So we don't know what was happening behind closed doors. What did they do to get the 10,000 earlier this year? There there was a a game this year where that entire stadium set a record out of all, obviously, the, you know, back when they were at Koss and Wild Horse Pass, they didn't have the capacity. Well, they had the capacity at Wild Horse Pass, but never reached it. What did they do? Whatever it is they did, they need to do that again. I get it, it was March, and I get the weather is beautiful here in March. We're getting there. It's late September. It's going to be early October. That October 7th game against New Mexico, potentially the last home game of the regular season or of the whole season if they don't host a playoff game. What would the reasoning be with that that doesn't have five, six, seven thousand 7,000 people in the stands, right? Like, unless the Diamondbacks are playing in the playoffs here that night, there's going to be nothing going on because, that's what I mean, is ASU football a draw? No. It, there's, there's really no – reason if you are even remotely a football fan a fan of this club you should be at that game right make the tickets almost almost free right you'll 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 make some money make the dollar like the dollar beer night people love to talk about even though that's st- the streak is over it's been over just just the little things and like i said earlier i know i'm repeating myself but it's you're trying to give them a reason to want to come back and when there is no next game this year they'll look forward to next season and you can repeat what you did back in march i just I don't know what they did personally. I kind of want to reach out and ask now and see if they had a, a certain marketing campaign for it. Look, it's it's one of those things where that that first game proved that it can be done. You can you can pack that stadium out. You can do it. And so the question, yeah, you're right. Is, is what's the difference? Where, where did it drop off? What did they fail to follow up on? What have they failed to? How have they managed or not managed to get some of those people out from that first game? And, you know, what, why have people come to that one maybe and not come back since? Um, how many people does that apply to? I mean, these are a lot of questions that that really get into the crux of this issue, which is a, a complicated one, but a, a really important discussion to have, um, an important one to, to think about going into the, you know, heading towards now the playoffs where You'd hope if Ryzen can capitalize on this well, um, especially if they do manage to get themselves a home playoff game, could get another decent crowd out again. But we'll we'll have to wait and see on that one. Yeah, I, I, I again, we we don't know because we're not, we're not in in that office and deploying those marketing strategies. But I know we can find out some answers pretty quickly. Indeed, indeed. Well, you know what. We'll take a quick uh, slide off here because Max may not be here, but his spirit lives on. Of course, we can't. The ad man, around. the ad man, the ad man. Of course, um, I did hear. Uh, I was chatting to you, Jake, about uh, some football games on earlier. You mentioned Vegas, and of course, that brings back the the inevitable story of in Vegas, where you end up with Max Simpson and the power of his shady rays that he's got on him, and what happens when Juan Guerra, a former defensive midfield international for. Uh, Venezuela comes up against him and uh, the simple answer is is that they 
despite being good quality, broke in that instance. But you know what? The best part about it is, of course, Shady Rays have that lifetime guarantee. He's able to reach out, get himself some new sunglasses, and it's not costing me anything. So, hey, he's already got his new shades. He's looking good. And I'm sure he'll be using them as he goes around, poking around in San Diego. Rumor has it that he's going to be doing a little bit of investigation over there. We'll have to see what he's investigating possibly in the area of Torero Stadium. But make sure to get your own Shady Rays, of course. And remember that exclusively for our listeners, Shady Rays is giving out their best deal of the season. Go to ShadyRays.com. Use code PHNX for 50% off two plus pairs of polarized sunglasses. Try for yourself the shades rated five stars by over 250,000 people. And of course, we've also got an away game coming up this weekend. Uh, I will... Not be able to be drinking, of course, while I'm there in the stadium. But if you're settling in to watch that one at home, make sure to do so with a four peaks. Trust me, if I could have a while wow, there watching the game, I'd be in a much better mood, especially if it's a game like last night's. But um, I made sure to come home, of course, last night, opened up the fridge, found myself a nice wow wheat and uh, plenty of our options as well. For those of you who prefer IPAs, of course, it's the Hazy. Uh, if you prefer something a little bit different, again, there's Kilt Lifter, lots of good stuff. Make sure to follow them on social at Four Peaks Brew and Four Peaks Pub to get all the latest from Four Peaks. And of course, lots of uh, fall-related stuff coming up right now. Of course, Oktoberfest, they've got the, the Pumpkin Porter making a comeback. They do the, the Haunted Brewery tours. We went on one of those last year lots of good stuff over there remember of course you must be 21 or older to drink four peaks and please enjoy responsibly right speaking of that away game jake el paso coming up this weekend you know what i'm gonna start off by kicking this one over to a video uh, earlier this week i was able to catch up with rachel phillips she's the sideline reporter for el paso locomotive and uh, she's just given me a quick summary on how this season's been going so far they had the a phenomenal start. To, well, actually, a pretty rough start to the year. I kind of forget about those first three games. It was loss after loss and very similar to the season prior. Then they go on this streak, which is just unheard of. And it's like, oh, my gosh, this is the best team in the league. Uh, and then, yeah, kind of just dropped off completely um, and didn't even really look like a team there for a while. But I think now they're kind of back plateauing at like a reasonable pace. Uh, it's been I guess a roller coaster. Maybe that is the best way to describe it. And maybe that was the easy answer off the get go is a roller coaster, lots of ups and downs, but on a flat right now, I would say. It's never, never straightforward in El Paso, is it, Jake? No. And, and I mean, I, again, she's the expert on all things El Paso, but just looking over their schedule, I mean, this team hasn't beat anybody not named Las Vegas or Hartford since June 3rd. And that was New Mexico. And New Mexico is not a very good team either. Um, I just don't think this El Paso's team is very good. They're they're able to beat the bottom barrel teams. But, I mean, if you just look at their last few games, I mean, again, you lose 1-0 to the sack on the road. I mean, a moral victory maybe. Um, you were able to draw OC away again. But, I mean, you lost at home to Monterey. You know, you lost to Indy at home. You lost to Phoenix Rising 5 nothing. So, I mean, it's just – I don't think this is a – a very talented squad. I just look where they're at in the standings. I mean, they're just outside the playoff spot battling, have a chance to jump Monterey if, if they can get a result against Phoenix. But again, they're, they're, they're a team Phoenix should beat. I mean, that's, it's, it's very simple, um, especially at this point in the season when you got to be playing at your best. These are the teams you beat. These are not the teams that you drop points to. Yeah, no, you, you look at this game and think the Rising have to come away with a win. Um, one thing I will say is you, you're looking at some of the, the way they played in those recent games, yes, they're, they're struggling to grind out wins. Okay, they had an unfortunate game against um, Sacramento, really, in their, their most recent one. Um, they, they've they improved defensively, though, quite a bit. Um, they've definitely done that since since the, the game against Phoenix, um, in, especially in these last few games. You look at the goals they've conceded, not very many. Um, again, yeah, opposition fight plays a factor in that. I mean, Orange County, they keep a clean sheet there. Um, Sacramento, they only give up the one, right? But this is a team that, They've scored really two goals this think, month. Yeah, I know they're not they're not a big goal scoring team, but they they don't concede too many goals. But that that's in some ways that's that's what El Paso I think as a team was set up as right. They, they, this team this year, you look at how they are. They're they're a team that really are more of a defensive first team. Um, that that have had their spells where they're better defensively and worse defensively. Better spells where they're better on the attack and worse on the attack. But but by and large, they're they're better 
defensively than they are in the attack. Um, and again, that, that's been something that's been more evident recently. Again, we'll, we'll turn it over to a, another video from Rachel now, actually, just talking a little bit about, about their defense and, and how they've kind of turned a little bit of a corner with them recently. A hundred percent. And I, Brian today at practice was saying that that was, that was kind of his key. That's the thing that he's really been trying to do is shore up that back line. And that's been the goal for them for these past, like I think really ever since that Phoenix 5-0 loss, as well as the RGB game. And uh, I think the Miami game, those three games together, there was like a ridiculous amount of goals scored against them to the point where you're like, is this even soccer? If you were to just look at the score line, because that's just way too many points to be seeing on a board. And I, that's not something they wanted to be. I mean, they, they obviously like have, weren't great at defending transition. And that was a big part of that. Um, and I think, like I said, the moving pieces really didn't help. But now, like, I think it looks like they've got kind of a solid kind of this is our starting 11 for the most part, maybe some changes here or there. But especially in that back line, that midfield, this is, these are our starters. And I think they finally are in a place where they they know how to help each other out and make sure they aren't letting in and leaking that many goals and especially the easy goals. I think that's what kills them. Like if they will always say if, if you go down there and, and beat them and and just outclass them and just get a good goal okay like and i think that's every team right okay like good on you that's the whole point of this game but if if we're just if they're just letting in goals easy because of transition or because of someone misses a tackle or you know that i've seen that with my own eyes i'm like how did that happen like that shouldn't have happened and it just it just does so i think that was really the painful thing for a lot of the team and the coaching staff but it, it looks like they've kind of gotten rid of those at least silly errors and silly mistakes and they're able to kind of stop those goals from coming in at least with noting of course jake i mean again you mentioned the the lights and hartford thing and you're not you're not wrong on that but the last five games they've conceded a total of three goals um it's definitely an improvement i think defensively there yeah and, and it, it's funny hearing her you know talk about the struggles that they have sometimes it kind of sounded like phoenix rising early when they were conceding goals that shouldn't have been conceded and she's right. If it, if a team outclasses you and puts one in, tip your cap and you move on. But it, they they seem to have figured out where they were leaking and how to stop those leaks. But they're not a very good team going forward. And I think matchup wise, um, given the system and the style that Juan has this team playing, I think this is going to be one of those games where El Paso sits deep. The low, you know, the infamous old old low block against Phoenix Rising. Can they break it down? Can they beat it? You know, I, I would uh, assume that all the firepower would be out onto the pitch to start and play as much as possible. And you try to get that early goal. That way they have to come out and play. And you can then get Danny in behind uh, uh, three, you know, three, four times potentially. And when one of them might go in and you can you can break it open again like you did when it was 5-0. Granted, you're not at home. You're not going to have any home support. It's I am I wonder what the pitch conditions will be. I mean, we've, we've known... Just going That's over the classic. Well, just going over the the history of teams that play against Phoenix, and I'm sure it's not just Phoenix that they do it against, but whether it's not watering the pitch, whether it's not cutting the grass, whether you know, just just the little home field advantage things that you can do to try to give your team the best shot against Phoenix and an informed Phoenix. I know they drop points, but they're still in form. Um, so it's it, it's a game that it I, I think could go it goes one or two ways, right? I think it's a repeat of what we saw or it's going to be another one of these one nil, nil, nil. It's, it's going to be just like a, like a old Spartan 3000, just holding the line and not trying to concede. And it's, if you can get the early goal, you'll, you'll get them to have to come out and you can catch them. You can catch them in behind when they, when they can't sit back anymore. Right. And that's, that's something that I think, look, they're going to have to rely on the defense really in this game, to be honest, El Paso, just because, they don't really have that much in the attack, right? And and that's not helped by the absences of, of certain people um, in, in recent weeks, and we'll get into that in a little bit. But they, they're not really a, a particularly good attacking side, right? It's individuals who maybe can get some things done, but you don't really have anyone of a... You know, when you look at Phoenix Rising, you say, right, Danny Trejo, you say Manuel Atiaga, you, you can, you know, in times you've got contribution as well coming in there from, from Panos Amanakis, but you don't have... Is there anyone really of that ilk at the moment who's currently playing with El Paso? They're just not getting minutes. Right. And I think a big thing that we can take from last night is 
El Paso didn't really, or excuse me, um, Indy didn't really create. I mean, they had a couple shots, but it was never really, I mean, Rocco was never tested truly. But the way they scored is what? A set piece off a corner. Mm -hmm. That's where any team, no matter how defensive they play, can be dangerous. And you can't. No matter switch. how good, no matter how bad they are, you get exactly. that one bounce. And you can't yeah. switch off in those moments. I mean, those moments almost have to be even more heightened in concentration. Because if you foul somebody on the edge of, you know, the the touchline and they're able to whip one in and they get on the end of it or flick it on or whatever it may be and they get that one goal, especially if it's the first goal, now you're down one nil. Now they're absolutely not going to even come out of their own half. Now you're going to have to do exactly what you're trying to do to them and they might catch you in behind. And then it's 2-0 and and you you wonder how this could ha possibly happen. So it's time to just you got to button down the hatches. You got to make sure that all everything's covered and there is absolutely no way El Paso scores. And eventually you should be able to break this team down because the quality on this team is there. It's just whether or not one of those games where the ball doesn't go in or is it one of these games where you can get ahead in the first 20 minutes and it's, you know, a two, three, maybe three, one game. Well, there's a couple of guys who've just been completely missing in recent weeks for El Paso locomotive. I'm going to run through them. It's, it's, it's Lucho, Luis Solignac up top. Uh, it's Edda Borelli, it's Yuma, right? They, there's no obvious public explanation for quite why they're, they're not been around, but they haven't been playing. They haven't been in the squad. They, they just aren't out there for El Paso right now. Now, one of those guys that really stands out, of course, is Lucho, right? Lucho is their leading goal scorer for this year. He's been a, a pretty critical piece for them over the years in a lot of different ways as a striker. Now, that's something I managed to ask uh, Rachel about and kind of get a, a feel for how they've adapted to, to playing without Lucho. And is anyone else going to step up? And let's have a listen to that one now. Yeah, I mean, you, you look at how many goals they're scoring, right? Like for the past however many years he's been here he has been the guy like he's always the guy to score he's he's been he was the uh leading goal scorer last year for the locos i'm pretty sure the year before he leads the locomotive in a goal scored all time for them like he is the guy uh and so i think him not being there yeah it's been a massive absence i mean you look at you just look at the lineup and i was looking at it just before like who who do you look at to be like he's going to be the person to score a goal for them I, there's not one person on that team that I look at and be like, that's the guy. Like, Alon Gomez, he has his moments, but he he hasn't been great this season. Ricardo Zacharias, he also has his moments, but he's last year in particular, he was much more on the assists kind of realm. Like, to me, I look at that team and I think Mark Nevada and Petar Petrovic, like, they're the two most lethal guys on the team and, and they play in the back line. <laughs> like, what, what does that say to you? You know what I mean? I, I think, like, they just don't have that strike power up front that they – have had that they have when Lucho's in the team. So I think it's a massive absence for them. And so it really even puts more pressure on their defense to be so rock solid because if they're not going to be able to score goals as frequently as what might have been possible in the past, then it becomes even harder. Yeah. It's again, it, it kind of comes back to just how how critical it is for rising, I think, to to pull ahead early. Look, I'm not expecting El Paso to play for a draw here, right? I understand the We've seen teams sitting back. That constantly comes up with Juan. We see teams sitting back and willing to kind of ride it. El Paso, right? We, we've got to put this in context. El Paso are on the outside looking in right now. They sit in ninth place. El Paso have to win games at home. They aren't in a position where they can say, oh, we'll just take a draw. They do have to go for the win. Now, maybe we see that change late in the game if Rising is still being held to nil-nil, and maybe they sit back then and say, well, we don't look like we're threatening, but they're all over us, so we're just going to sit back and we're just going to try and play out a draw. But I don't see El Paso playing for a point. I'd be shocked if they played for a point really going into this game. And so, again, it, it's it's going to be difficult, I think, for El Paso to really get much going on the goal front. So from Rising's perspective... You've got to find a way, I think, to get through early, uh, find a way to keep pounding on them and just really going after additional goals. Um, you, I don't expect a 5-0 result again at all. I don't think anyone no. expects a 5-0 result going into this game. But at the same time, right, we're at the point of the season when you just have against teams that are desperate. Yeah, and that's a good point that, you know, I'm, I'm looking at their remaining four games after their El Paso host Phoenix. It's Charleston, San Diego, Memphis, and Oakland. I mean, you tell me where the where the three points is easy. It's for them. It's not. I mean, it's they not. have to get 
they have to get every point they can just to scrap to get into the playoffs. So you have a good point there to where they're they probably see this as a game that they have a a chance to get three points and they'll probably be like you said, they'll they'll be more aggressive than than maybe if this game was played in July. But it it, it gives opportunity. I mean that if anything, Phoenix wants a team that plays against them. They don't want a team that sits back. No. I mean that, that, that that's not enjoyable for anybody. Literally, like, not, the players don't enjoy that. Not the fans definitely don't. We don't. So I, I am interested to see how aggressive they are. You have a good point in that. Yeah, if it's the 80th minute, it's one one. It's nil nil. They realize, hey, probably not going to be able to to go for the three points without exposing ourselves because God knows Phoenix is going to be going for all three points at that point. Maybe they try to use Phoenix's aggression against them and try to, you know, get in behind against them as they soak up pressure uh, as Phoenix goes, they'll pick their spots. It, it'll be an interesting game. Like you said, with the, with the desperation of where we're getting now into the season to where every team that's playing needs a result and there's only three points or maybe one point to piece to be, to be shared. It, it, it's definitely going to be an interesting one. Tactically. I, I think Phoenix has the advantage for sure. Um, but this league, man, I mean, every week, this, this, this league just shows you something. I mean, we were, we were following along with the Monterey San Diego game and it was two nil and we figured that was done and dusted. And all of a sudden it's three, two San Diego wins. Right. And they were on the road and we thought, Oh, this team is literally folding. This team is, is seeing it's, it's twilight hours and days. And it's for what, you know, they're, the players are fighting for their jobs as well. So it's, it's just a wild time of year. The weather's getting nice. It won't be hot. It might be a little humid, um, but nothing too unbearable. So I think it's it's just the most exciting time of the year, honestly. I mean, you got mm-hmm. three games a week for the most for a lot of these teams the rest of the season, and yeah, man, it's all it's all it's all up for grabs. It's if you want to go and take it. There is it is all up for grabs now. One person that that Max I know Max was talking about earlier uh, today, uh, someone who he's interested to see how he looks, Benny Diaz in the El Paso goal. Um, Max, his recollection is we saw a guy who got a little bit emotional as the game was going on uh, against Phoenix the last time they came in, and about if he can try and keep some of that in check a little bit more, um, especially if they start conceding goals and keep his head on and just... I mean, that was a rough time, to be perfectly frank, for, for him, for the... I mean, the defense weren't exactly doing him any favors, but that was coming towards the end of a stretch where they were conceding goals left, right, and center. Right? They they ended up conceding five away to RG, uh, away to RGV, four away to Miami, five away to Phoenix. Right? Yeah, your goalkeeper's got some influence on that. You don't concede that many goals if your defense are doing a job. Um, it's it'll be interesting. It'll be interesting. You know what though? I'm gonna I'm gonna turn it over to you now, Jake. What is your score prediction? I'm going to go 2-0. We have a clean sweep of 2-0 predictions. Jake, me, Max, we've all gone 2-0. Wow. We did not right. discuss this. This is We did not discuss this. Everyone's going 2-0 Phoenix here, right? Jake, who are you picking for your goal scorers? Give me Danny Trejo and Give me a Danny Trejo brace. He's matching me. I went Danny Trejo brace. Max has gone a Manuel Arteaga brace. Wow. I thought uh, about splitting them, but that's too perfect, I think. Indeed, indeed. But I'll uh, let's have a look at the chat here, what they're saying. Bandidas Bluebird, El Paso lose 3 0. So it's 3 0 rising in that one. Thomas with 3 1 to Phoenix. Uh, we got a 1 0 Phoenix as well. Panos score. There we go. Panos goal. 2 1 Phoenix. Uh, lots of positivity. People feeling good. People feeling good. I mean, they should. I mean, like I said, this El Paso team is not good, but no, no. And you know, if <laughs> they're this was for a reason, right? They, they, this is a right. league where two thirds of the teams make the playoffs, and they're currently right. on the outside looking in. Yeah, so they're on the bottom third. And if we, if you asked me this two months ago, I'm not this confident. Away from home, granted, the the weather would have been a little different, but this team, this Phoenix Rising team, has has picked it up. It's they've figured it out. Right, they've they've understood what the assignment is. They're not conceding the stupid goals anymore. Right? Yeah, you you allowed an equalizer at the death on a corner. It happens. It happens. It it, it happens. But 
the stupid passing it to the other team in your own box and turning it over in your own end, that stuff's not happening anymore. The passing is clean and crisp, and if it's not there, it's a clearance. And it's it's smarter play. Um, there are times where the buildup isn't there, which is what we saw in the first half last night. It was awful. Um, but it's the second game after the blowout, which – I haven't actually looked at what those games have been, but I, I do know that the games after the blowouts have not been great. So you look, you think that they bounce back. The way that it happened, you're gutted, you're pissed. You want to just get back out and and, and, and play again. So I think we'll see a, a full starting 11, or at least full as, as can be. Um, and yeah, I mean, Rocco was not really tested last night. The defense is playing as well as it has all year. Granted, the clean sheets have not been there, but you have a, an unfortunate one like last night. Again, it, it's it's the, the confidence that this team should have going in should be fine. They're 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 in form. They're playing well. They they should do a job. Indeed, indeed. Well, you know what? We're going to turn it over a little bit now, Jake. Uh, I believe a, a few weeks ago we had you on the podcast back when we had a certain promotional code for some. Uh... Some OGs. Uh, have you got a review for us here, Jake? How have you found them? Um, they're uh, they're quite tasty, actually. Pretty good. That is, is high the, uh... praise indeed from Jake Anderson. <laughs> yeah, I've been uh, I've been I've been out of town. I've been traveling. I've been sharing the wealth, as they say. Sharing the wealth, it... as they say. We've had some good reviews in the chat as well from uh, some of the people here in the chat about them. So. Uh... If you want to go and uh, help yourself as well, get yourself, uh, find out what all the buzz is about that uh, Jake is clearly, I mean, endorse them a little bit more strongly if you want, Jake. I'm blanking on the flavor. I think it's like a strawberry lemonade, something like that. Oh, you did that. You did the pink lemonade back when they pink had the pink lemonade. lemonade. There it is. The, the, I, the I got summer, the red. Summer edition. There yeah. No, the summer edition, the pink lemonade. Yeah. I heard a lot of good things about the pink lemonade. Um, if you're if you're big into flavor, if that's important to you, that's the one to go with. They they work, I can attest. Mm -hmm. Indeed, indeed, and they're good gummies as well. So they've got as well uh, the mixed bags, of course. You got the fruits mixed bag with the red apple, watermelon, and peach. You got the creams mixed bag, the blackberries and cream, orange creamsicle, uh, peaches and cream, and uh, yeah, go out and check them out at your local dispensary. And, uh, of course, you can find them on socials as well at OG's Brand and online at ogsbrands.com. That's O-G-E-E-Z brands.com. To find a local dispensary near you, you must be 21 or over to enjoy responsibly. Meanwhile, you know, Tuesday night, rumor has it that myself and Max, we made a little uh, little trip down to Valley Tap Room where we managed to finish second in the, uh, the trivia on Tuesday. We finished second, Jake, would you believe? How many teams do you think there were? one there was more than two <laughs> but we did finish second we had a good time there lots of good beers 30 taps on there and of course other stuff around the corner cans bottles good stuff uh, they got a, a light bar menu there you can bring in food from elsewhere as well have a really nice time it's a great vibe down there make sure to check them out off of the 202 and gilbert and uh, next time that myself and max go down there of course anyone wants to swing and say hi uh, more than happy to spend the night chatting some Phoenix Rising over a few beers for you. Stay posted. We'll 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 do it at some point in the near future, I'm sure. That are purchased uh, by Max. Well, rumor has it that sometimes, sometimes Max does indeed buy beers. Rumor has it. I, I'm hearing that Max does buy beers, and he's and not Marks. here to defend himself here today. And Margs, he did buy 17 beers for someone on the party last night, didn't he? I remember he that, had that yes. request in for seventeen dollars dollar beer night, and he paid at, it at ASU Max on Venmo. Indeed, at ASU Max on Venmo. Make sure to send him all of your uh, beer receipts, and uh, Max may or may not pay them out. We'll see. We'll see. But let's have a look now around the USL Championship this weekend. There's a lot of games going on, some of which have more impact on on rising and on potential playoff seeding than others. Um, I'll just start running through some of those games at the minute. Uh, one of them, really, I think, if New Mexico United are, are hoping to keep their playoff up to life, they're about three points back right now. They're away to Pittsburgh Riverhounds. That's going to be a, a, a tough game for them to get a result shortly. Yeah, Pittsburgh has been the cream of the crop this year. I mean, especially when they're at home. I, 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 don't, I don't know the last time they lost at home, to be honest. Um, 
Yeah, those Bob Dilly sides, man, they know how they, they know how to defend. That happy for Joe Farrell. Yeah, we, we saw that really when Rising went up there to Pittsburgh, of course. Rising go down one nil in the first half, and Pittsburgh just say, right, shut up, shut up, great. We've we've done it. And it worked. Um <laughs> can't argue it didn't work. Wow. Our, they actually lost to Indy three to one on July twenty sixth, mm. but one Aiden Quinn was available that night. Indeed, indeed. Of course, Aiden not available for Indy in their last game and probably not going to be available for a while, um, I think is the, the safe thing to say. They're looking around at some other games, maybe a little bit more of a focus on some of the Western Conference here. As you see, Colorado Springs Switchbacks will be hosting Sacramento Republic. Sac, of course, Currently four points clear at the top of the table with four games to go. Colorado Springs currently in sixth place. They are right there on the playoff line, really. El Paso, of course, only one point behind them. Um, but for Colorado Springs, now it's surely got to be the time to really, really be be hoping that they can turn things around. They've had a bit of a, a mixed run of form, right? Yeah, they beat Orange County last week. They drew against San Antonio before that, which isn't too bad, but losses against Louisville, Monterey Bay before that. Again, it's it's a real mixed bag with that team, and, and they're struggling, I think, to find consistency. Yeah, and, and Sacks kind of cooled off from that, that hot streak that they were on. They've kind of had some mixed results as well. They haven't, you know, they've, they don't score a bunch, um, but they do defend well. And Colorado's home record is not as good as you would think it it, it should be anyway, especially with the elevation. Um, it's a beautiful stadium. Um, but, yeah, like you said, it's one of those that where Colorado now is not in desperation mode, but they're tied with so many teams on 40 points with an El Paso and a New Mexico within grasp. So it's it's one of those where you can't afford to lose points. And so – if they do go down, I expect them to see. It's one of those where like you you have to go for it, and uh, if you get caught, it could get ugly. And now, one of those ones is really critical right around the two, three, four, five. However, it ends up shaking out here. But San Antonio FC playing Orange County. Orange County, of course, one point ahead of both San Diego and Phoenix Rising. Uh, but they are four points back on San Antonio, who themselves are four points back on Sacramento at the top of the table. Now, Orange County, they had their hot run. They were doing very well. Of course, nine wins in a row, I believe, and then a draw and then a loss. San Antonio are winless in six. Now, granted, five of those games are draws, but they are six games without a win. We saw that kind of a run out of them earlier this year. This is a bad time to be kind of getting caught up in that kind of a run, isn't it, for San Antonio? And three of those were nil-nil draws. Remember that. Yeah. So while the defense is there, the offense for a team that scores a lot of goals in the beginning of the season, and even the middle of the season, especially during that hot run, I mean, they – I don't want to call them lucky, but they they really sca saved themselves against Tampa at home. Um, look, look at some of those results, right? Tampa are a good team, sure. Mm -hmm. Switchbacks are barely playoffs. Tulsa are not great. RGV are not great. Pittsburgh are a good side, fair enough. Monterey Bay are not a great team either. It's not as though they've been playing all the giants of the league and struggling to get results. No, and I love how there's a Sunderland friendly in the middle, middle of the season. <laughs> but, but yeah, it, it's, it's, it's like we said earlier, like this league, it kind of just, it, it, it goes all over the place. Right. And, you know, they, they, they had a, they still have a golden boot, golden boot contender, but they, they cool, they cooled off. They didn't score for three matches. They didn't concede for three matches. Um, and now they're playing OC twice in three matches. And we'll see, we'll see, we'll see because San Antonio's, I don't know, like the last two months I've, I've expected big things out of San Antonio and they've disappointed me, I guess, in terms of what I've expected. Right. I mean, they rescued a point at the death against Tampa. Tampa seems to be turning up right now at the right time, which they seemingly always do come playoff time. They they seem to be one of the best teams in the league, no matter where they're at in the table. Um, they're usually hovering in that top four. So, I mean, San Antonio was a team that you asked me a month ago, I would have feared and not wanted to play in the playoffs if I'm Phoenix. Like you just alluded to, this might be a good time to actually catch them. 
Yeah. Now, looking at another game in there, of course, two teams right on the playoff line getting ready to battle it out. You've got Monterey Bay. They'll be traveling to Oakland Roots in the late game on Saturday. Oakland as a team, I mean, well, look, both of these teams right now dead on the playoff line. They're both on 40 points. El Paso right behind them. Um, Oakland have fallen off a cliff. Let's be perfectly honest, right? They have lost four games in a row. Now, Monterey Bay, yes, they dropped points in that last game. It's a bad one to give them away late in the way that they did. But by and large, have been finding a little bit more form. You look at Oakland, you look at their last few games. Lost 1-0 to, to Tulsa. Lost 3-1 to Vegas. Lost 1-0 to Sacramento. Lost 2-1 to Louisville. Yes, some of those results are, are excusable. I understand that, but... Again, Vegas, Tulsa at home. Three one to Vegas, probably not. and they had the lead, so they allowed three Indeed. consecutive. Indeed, they did. It's the it's, mighty Cashman Field fortress. It's got to be a time to be worrying, I think, right now if you're Oakland Roots. Now they are a team that historically like to make it in as one of the last seeds possible. Um, that's just kind of the Oakland way, and then sometimes they make a little bit of noise when they do get in as well. They did, of course, when they they managed to sneak in uh, in. Wolfman has got a, got a result against El Paso um, back in 2020 or 2021. Um, it, that was it. There yeah, we go. 21. Okay, 21. Um, thank you for the clarification there. Yeah, 21 would be because that was when Oakland entered the league. Um, but they're, they're a team that sometimes can make some noise from those those lower positions. I mean, they did it in San Diego last year when San Diego Law had a complete and utter meltdown. Um, but I, I don't know right now they, they, it's worrying right it's got to be worrying if you're an Oakland fan speaking of San Diego though we should give them a shout of course San Diego will be playing on Sunday this week they're not playing in their usual Saturday uh, well they've got a few of these Sunday games throughout the season but it's currently sitting in fourth place San Diego loyal game in hand over Phoenix head to head over Phoenix as well of course dead level on points they are hosting Las Vegas Lights now if Vegas, who are now eliminated from uh, contention. Been eliminated. They are eliminated. They, if they manage to get themselves a result there in San Diego, I mean, if you're San Diego Law, you've just got to be kicking yourself if you can't take all three points. Anytime you play Vegas, I mean, Phoenix is one of those. <laughs> Phoenix, is, Phoenix is one of the teams that they've beaten, and it was in Phoenix, no less. Yeah, but that was that game was quite frankly shocking and should never have happened. Eighteen they, losses. They, they performed in that it's game. Conceded fifty-eight times. Yeah, minus twenty-five goal different. Minus twenty-five. Only Hartford is worse, and that's why I made it a point to say that El Paso hasn't beaten a team that isn't literally dead last in the standings. They're the only two teams third. that are currently eliminated. Yeah, yeah it, it's it's. I mean, El Paso's got thirty-nine points. They're not very good. And you just, I'm just looking at the standings now, and it's just RGV is not very good. And I'm just thinking about all the missed opportunities Phoenix has had, but can't worry about it now. Got to go. Got to just look forward. You know what I'll say, though? If I had to – if I knowing that Oakland love to pull off an upset in the first round on the road, for me, if I could see lined up an Oakland Roots traveling to San Antonio game, to me, that's prime for an upset, right? Or if we want to get, well, oh, I guess Monterey. I'm, I'm just looking at these Northern California Monterey are on teams. better form. Northern California yeah. teams playing sack. You could potentially yeah. get some fans to go and travel, and you could have some support while you're there. You Sac's could. not an easy place to play. We know that, but no, it's not. Having any support would help. It would. It would indeed. Right. Well, that's drawing us towards a close now of course if you're making the trip over to el paso this weekend a i'll see you there and b make sure before you fuel up to uh sign up for the inner circle program from circle k uh it's a f completely free program uh, you end up saving 25 cents per gallon on your first five fill-ups uh there's other things that you can get for free as well you can get free snacks uh all kinds of stuff there. Make sure to go grab and pick up a Polar Pop. It's a long trip over there, right? It is a long drive over to El Paso. Um, take up a good amount of your Saturday, I'm sure, to get over there. But uh, I'll see you over there. But again, remember to join the Inner Circle for free by downloading the Circle K app today. Terms and conditions apply. And at participating locations, visit circlek.com for details. And of course, you can also... Become a diehard as well uh, with us at PHNX. Gives you a whole new platform. This is the way I always advertise it. A whole new platform to cyberbully Max. Max may not be here, 
but you can find him on the Discord. Rumor has it that if you you ask him about, I mean, he showed socks yesterday, didn't he? On the on the post game show, he showed socks. Um, but uh, I he was think asking, people he was asking me to show my peg. <laughs> oh, peg was the new one. Yeah. Oh God, that's the new one. Yeah. But um. Yeah, if you want to find a new uh, platform to Cyber Bully Max, and of course also get other things that probably matter a little bit more, like discounts on merch, free share every year, access to all of our written content, then make sure to go sign up as a diehard. Uh, go to go to phnx.com. You can also uh, find some of that nice merch as well. Uh, we're running very low on the PHNX Rising uh, shirts in the moment, so if you want to grab one before they're gone, but you end up like Max Simpson, who doesn't actually have a PH Next Rising shirt anymore, because uh, don't don't be like Max. Don't be like Max. Go get yourself one before they are gone. Head to phnxlocker.com. Right. I think, Jake, that's about rounding us out for the night. Uh, remember, of course, you can catch the PH Next Rising pregame show. We actually got some more content from Rachel Phillips, the El Paso Locomotive Sideline reporter, on that one as well you can catch it on az family half hour before the start of the game and az family sports it's channel 44 over the air 13 via cox and of course we'll be back for a post game show after that match as well with fans reaction but jake any last thoughts as i've just spewed a load of words out into the effort this is the time of the year that you have to show what you're worth right you're a Midwestern Conference table team, slightly on the top end of it in terms of total, but if we're looking at the playoff picture, you're right in the middle. Get a home playoff match. I, I think if if you can do that, you give yourself an opportunity to go into the second round. Juan has shown when he was at Oakland, he has the ability, like you were talking about with Oakland, to pull off an upset, right? And if this team which I think this team has the opportunity to go on a run. It definitely has the talent to do so. You catch fire at the right time, you can do it. And who knows? I mean, for all the years that we saw Phoenix dominate this league and we expected them to make a final and lift a trophy, it never happened, right? The closest they've come is a 1-0 loss to Louisville and a game that we'll never, we'll never know what happened because of reasons that we do know. But... Maybe this is the time. Maybe they maybe they needed to be the four or five seed. I mean, remember when they made the final as Louisville, and even when they made the final against Tampa that never played, they weren't the one seed. And when they were the one seed, they were extremely disappointing at home. So maybe this is the formula. I, I don't know. It 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 it's it's it is what it is for this season. They've caught form at the right time. They're not a hundred percent healthy, but they're as close to being healthy as possible for any team. Going forward, you got Danny Trejo who leads the league in goals and assists. I mean, there's not much more you can ask for. I mean, this is this is a golden opportunity. So I hope they take advantage of it. This is the time. Well, Jake, thank you for taking the time to join me today. Thank you, of course, as well to our producer, Jacob, and our special assistant producer in training, Hadley, as well, who uh, did a very good job, clearly. Um, look, this is where it, the Juan Guerra reign started, El Paso. He needed a big result there. They didn't manage to put it off that day. Can they do it this year? We'll find out on Saturday. Until then, good night.